Thank you for joining us for Online Church. We're so glad to have you watching with us today. During the stream, we encourage you to worship with us and invite the presence of God into your home. Feel free to connect with us and those who are tuning in by commenting throughout our live stream. Let's stay connected. Links to submit your prayer requests and online giving are added in our description below. We hope you enjoy the service.
all of the glory belongs to me. All of the glory belongs to you. God, all of the glory belongs to you. God, you deserve Thank you so much for worshiping with us today at First Church. If you'd like to give, there are three ways to do so. You can text to give by texting 704-455-5353. You can download the Tithely app or visit our website, firstchurchclt.com slash give. A link will be provided in the description. Let's take the opportunity to realize that God can meet you wherever you are. He inhabits our praises. We encourage you to continue to engage with us. Let us know if you need anything, any prayer or any other requests you may have. Let's stay connected. Greetings, everyone. Pastor Nathan here. We miss you. We're looking forward to the time where we all can come back together. And I believe that time is, is getting near. And we'll have to see how the details of all of it is, uh, works out. But I'm looking forward to it. And we are going to have a great regathering time, time together. In the meantime, let's keep our faith strong. Uh, let's keep praying one for another. Um, if you'll watch the community group on Facebook, you'll get a continuing list of prayer requests that um, Pastor Lisa organizes and pushes out to all of us. It's a great resource for us. And so let's keep one another's needs in prayer. Let's be prayerful for the many families who have lost loved ones uh, during this time, the many families who have lost jobs, um, whether those, however that is expressed in their individual life. Um, let's, let's, let's pray for our, our generation. Let's pray for our city, our state. I'm praying the Lord would bring out of this circumstance, I'm praying the Lord would bring a spiritual good out of it that looking back, we can see how the Lord, the Lord used it and the Lord some way, in, in some way recycled it in our lives for His glory. Let's get right into the Scripture. We are, we are looking at a passage in the Scripture that isn't often preached about. I've only, looking back at my own history of preaching, 
I, I think I've only preached from this image two or three times, um, and so I, I, I want to spend some time with it here today. And the image is given to us in the 26th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and this is where Jesus is betrayed, uh, and the the soldiers of the temple guard are led to him by the betrayer Judas, and there in this garden of Gethsemane, this garden of the olive press, where the fruit of the vine is crushed into into uh, wine. Um, this is where Jesus will be betrayed, and here he is praying intensely. The disciples are trying to pray, but uh, sometimes all-night prayer meetings can be difficult, and like many of us, he, uh, the disciples find that it's, it's just very relaxing there, and they keep slipping off into sleep. Um, the, the, problem, the problem is one of spiritual perception. Um, it's, it's really hard to stay focused, it, to stay prayerful, and stay motiv- motivated if you don't have a sense of the times. Um, it's just like, I'll give you an example. Um, five years ago, about five years ago, uh, Bill Gates did a TED Talk presentation on the continuing risk of a epidemic. Um, and uh, the whole world listened and was like, yeah, that's good. Uh, he's a notable, notable personage in our time, in our generation. And he did a great job of presenting the risks of an epidemic. And, you know, uh, this is five years ago, and the whole world was like, yeah, that's, that's good. We should think about that. And uh, there was a few people who thought a little bit, <clears throat> and that was pretty much the end of it. They even ended uh, funding on uh, coronavirus-type outbreaks. This isn't the first coronavirus uh, that our world has faced. Um, they funded some SARS research. That's the um, Southeast Asia uh, Respiratory Syndrome. They, they funded some um, MIRS research, which is uh, Middle East um, uh, Respiratory Syndrome. Another, all these are coronaviruses. <clears throat> they, they funded some, but it didn't seem important. And so <clears throat> over time, the, the funding dried up. Now, none of these people involved in this, the politicians who would vote the funding into place, the scientists who would advocate for it, <clears throat> Excuse me, none of them, none of them wanted to be unprepared. Um, Even the governmental agencies that did not renew the stockpiles of of personal protective equipment, PPE, none of them were like, oh yeah, let's just be unprepared. No, they're all paying the price for it right now. The truth is, we weren't prepared. The truth is, we didn't refill stocks of personal protective equipment. The truth is, we had enough knowledge, we just didn't know at what level to weigh it. Um, should it matter more than this? Well, we just didn't know. And so we were, we were profoundly unprepared, and we paid a price for it, and that price will be continuing. Uh, I think there's a similar image spiritually with the disciples. It's not that they want to abandon Jesus. It's, it's not that they, they're looking to, in some way, not be there when they're needed. It's just so hard to know where our focus should be. And when we do not know where our focus should be, we always end up in apathy. When we do not see what the battle at hand is going to look like, we default to spiritual apathy. And here are the disciples. Uh, Yeah, Jesus has been talking about this for several weeks now, and I I guess it'll happen, and who knows? And uh, we had a great time together, and now I'm tired, and I just, you know, uh, that is really a picture of trying to perceive spiritual reality through the perception of the flesh. And it's not just the apostles, not just just them. It's true of all of us. If some of us had known what we would be facing this year, we would have prepared differently, but we didn't know. What we need, really, uh, is better spiritual understanding, better uh, spiritual eyes to see with, and so uh, that needs to be a continuing prayer of each one of us who seeks to be strong in the Lord. Lord, let me see with understanding that I might be prepared to help. Um, This is what's happening in the passage here, and Jesus Uh, on uh, really just the day before has made a very odd request of the disciples. And it starts with a statement he makes in his teaching. He says this, look, and this is in the Luke account. 
um, if you don't have a sword, why don't you sell your cloak and go buy a sword? And Peter, he looks around. He's like, well, we have, we have two swords. Lord, we have two swords. And the Lord says back to him, okay, that's enough. Now, this is very interesting. What's with the swords? Why do we need swords? Um, I, I've heard this taught and preached different ways. I myself have taught it and preached it different ways. Um, I, I currently, where my current thoughts are, is that the Lord was going to teach one last lesson to disciples who desperately needed to get it. And the lesson was so important that he didn't want to just tell them, he wanted to show them. Let me say that again. The lesson was so important, he didn't want to just lecture on it, he wanted to demonstrate it. And in order to demonstrate it, he needed a prop. Whenever a teacher, a communicator uses a prop, sometimes it can hit home in a way that nothing else can. Um, recently, I was teaching on grace and mercy, and I used a prop of giving someone uh, money here at the church. And I, Now, I had taught many times on grace and mercy, and uh, a quick reminder, mercy is when you are not given what you deserve. In other words, you deserve punishment, but you're not given that. Um, it's withheld. But grace is when you're giving, given something you did not deserve. Mercy is when you're not given what you deserve. And grace is when you're given something you don't deserve. And I, I, I've taught that many, many times, and you've heard it. But I used the illustration. I used a, a $20 bill, and I had one of the young people step up. And I said, okay, here's the example. Uh, you've been bad. You deserve punishment, but I'm going to spare you this punishment, and you're not going to get it. How does that feel? Uh, I've not given you what you deserve. Now, grace is when I actually give you something you don't deserve. And I use the example of the money, and I, I put that in their hand. And I, I had more texts, emails, calls from people. Now, remember, I've taught this several times. I had more, teach, more people reach out to me saying, I got it. I, I mean, I had, for a week there, I was really impressed. And I was happy that it had really resonated with them because it got through the filter, and they were able to really get it on an emotional level, the difference in mercy and grace. So uh, that's the value of a prop. If you can use a prop, a lot of times people will get it on a level. They won't get it simply with a lecture. That's what I believe is about to happen because as the, the soldiers of the temple guard follow Judas into this garden of crushing, this place of betrayal, Judas steps forward identifying Jesus, and I should point out that the, 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 the soldiers needed uh, someone to identify Jesus because he did not in any way make himself notable to the eye. He wore ordinary clothes. He did not wear the uh, official signs of a rabbi teacher such as uh, tassels or phylacteries, that's a, another word for these things, and that would make him notable, like a priestly robe or some formal teaching attire. He dressed as a common individual. You couldn't have, you couldn't have known who he was just by a description. You needed someone to point him out. And so this is the role of Judas, and Judas steps forward, kisses Jesus, and um, the Lord, you know, asks him this question, uh, I don't want to get bogged down in the story too much. Let me move along. Um, this, the, the soldiers uh, go to lay hands on Jesus, and now Peter, Peter makes a Peter mistake. Peter has a certain personality type, and he, he, he tends to make a certain type of mistake. And he's bold sometimes when he should be humble. He's loud sometime, sometimes when he should be quiet. Um, and he's definitely overconfident, and I'm glad he's in the story because uh, many of us at times make these same mistakes. Now, he pulls a sword. He tries to behead the servant of the high priest. And as you all know, uh, Peter's not a trained soldier. He's really good at fishing, not so good at fighting. And uh, he aims for a head, and what he gets is he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And the Lord stops him. The Lord stops him. And I, I want to read this passage to you um, in uh, Matthew 26, and we are reading in uh, verse number 50. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. 
But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. I want you to remember that. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions of angels. Um, Peter, put your sword in its place. This can read confusing to just the the first take on it. And I, I believe so many of these scriptural insights are given to us in the same manner that uh, Abraham was given the pursuit of a city whose builder and maker is God. Uh, Abraham will spend his life pursuing something, seeking something that doesn't exist and and won't exist for many, many years, just the promise of it, the idea of it. Uh, A city one day will exist and it will descend from on high and that will be a city whose builder and maker uh, is God. But Abraham and uh, Isaac and Jacob, they, they are given this quest to seek uh, the city of God. And uh, I think we all of us as people of faith, of faith are still on this quest of seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. And many times pursuing the presence of God can feel just like that. Pursuing understanding in uh, the things of the Spirit can, can look just like that. And yet that is exactly what we have have committed our life to doing, not just to reading the Bible as though it's a formula, you know, that you can pound someone over the head with. You can't simply read the Bible saying, oh, once I get my, you know, my five-step formula, (laughs) then I'm going to, I'm going to be done with it. It, That's not the point. We pursue the presence of God, do you see? We pursue the, the knowledge of the Lord, right? We pursue his word in our heart, his presence in our life. This is what it means to be spiritual people. We are pursuing the kingdom of God, not just a city whose builder and maker is God. Uh, We have more understanding now. And so we pursue the heart and the actions of the king. That is what it means to pursue the kingdom of God. It has the same type of feel as a city whose builder and maker is God. You have to understand what God is doing. You have to understand what God has said he will do. You have to understand the heart and the nature of the king who is doing these things. This is what it means to be spiritual people. This is why we should be humble. This is why we should be resolute. This is why we should be slow to judge others. And we should be quick to seek guidance. This is why uh, we live this way. Uh, This moment is so profound because I think it is teaching uh, the disciples how we don't do it. And this lesson is so important that Jesus doesn't just want to lecture on it. He wants, he truly wants to show them. You see, there are lessons that you must catch. You can't be taught them. They must not, they're, they're not taught, they're caught, do you see? And, 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 and this, these disciples, um, they may not always know how to do it right, but they need to know how, how the, the wrong way is. In other words, there's a lot of seeking and desiring and learning and growing that we pursue in the kingdom of God, but the Lord gives us an example of how we're not going to do it. And this is that, the, the moment Peter draws his sword, and he tries to kill, and the Lord says, no, Peter, that is not how we're going to do it. That's the wrong way. If you do it that way, you're going to get the fruit of that way. Let me say it this way. If you use violence, you're going to get the fruit of violence. If you use anger, you are going to get the fruit of anger. If you use rage and and political violence and uh, protest and hatred, you are going to be the children of those things. Now we all of us can see in in religious history and church history where religious movements chose those things. And they are the darkest stories of the religious impulse. They are the darkest moments within the human experience because we have used evil things to do something that which we think of as as good. Peter, that's not how we're going to do it. I need you to see, guys. It's as though putting it in modern vernacular, Uh, Someone would say to a group of men, guys, you've got to get this. We're trying to do something here. 
Um, and we're going to pursue it in different ways. We have different personalities, different gifts. We have different callings. We have, well, there, there will be a different array of efforts. Not all of you are going to preach on the day of Pentecost. That's Peter, that he has a gift for that. But, um, you know, we're going to do things according to our gifts and our talents, and we're pursuing something good here. But let me show you how we're not going to do it. That is not the way. Peter, put up your sword. Um, what is the kingdom of God supposed to feel like? Now, this is an interesting question because anyone who has sought to lead others, anyone who has sought to be a spiritual leader, um, you see in others that which is in you. The errors in a teacher can be compounded in the student. Now, this isn't this isn't my idea, it's a biblical idea. Um, this is why James says, look, not many of you should be teachers. Um, <laughs> that, that can sound strange when our, uh, our, whole fo- our whole focus is many times evangelistic and we all want to be teachers. And um, I, I want to have you consider something that there's very little risk in being a witness, but sometimes there's risk in being a teacher. I think that's the point. That's the tension. And so many biblical truths are shown uh, in this tension. There's very little risk in being a witness. In a witness, your job uh, is simply to tell what God has done for you. A teacher tells other people how they ought to do it. Now, this can be the risk. And the Bible says, this isn't my idea. The Bible says there will be a greater judgment upon those who teach than those who listen. All preachers everywhere should take that seriously because here's the risk. If I build a church with an attitude of rebellion, it's going to be doubled in the church. If I build a church with the attitude of anger, if in my comportment and in my style there is disgust and there is anger and there is contempt and there is hatred, if that oozes out of me, It's going to be doubled, at least, in the people who follow. Again, this is not my idea. Jesus points out to the Pharisees that they will move heaven and earth to make a convert. But there's a problem. Once they've made a convert, that convert is twice the son of hell that the Pharisee was. Oh, my. Now you say, where's that in the Bible? Well, just look up the woes of the, the, uh, uh, of the Pharisees. There's five woes of the Pharisees talked about in two different Gospels, and you can, uh, you can look that up and read all about it. As a teacher, I am building something. I am communicating something. It's not all doctrinal formula. There is a style, there is a feel to it. How should the church feel? I, let me just say this. I, I want to get this right. Um, I, I, I deeply want to get this right. I, I don't want to come across in a way where I'm quick to be ugly. I'm quick to speak against sinners as though they, they have no value. I want, I want to remember that God died for them. I don't want to be quick to find enemies in other church organizations. I don't want to be quick to pretend like other preachers are, are somehow valueless. I, I don't want to do that because if I do that, I will be making something ugly of a kingdom that is supposed to be beautiful. So let me uh, try to wrap up here and uh, answer this question of what is the kingdom of heaven supposed to feel like. So this is what I, I, I sincerely believe. Um, if you look in the New Testament, lists of things are actually fairly rare. Um, there is a lot of open-handedness in invoking people to a closer walk with God. Now, you can pretend there isn't, but (laughs) it's right there for you to read. There's a lot of open-handedness. Even when you take an example of someone like Paul, who is leading a group of believers to a deeper understanding, and there there is, um, there is at, I think there is, um, I'm I'm thinking of two right now where he does this, but... um, like, for example, um, where he meets believers, and he asks them, have they been baptized since they believed? And uh, they say, well, we've been baptized <clears throat> by uh, John's baptism. Um, but, you know, that's, that's where we're at. I want you to see how gentle Paul is in that 
passage of Scripture. This was the book of Acts, chapter 19, I believe, um, where Paul leads them to greater understanding. Do you see? Also, I want you to see him on Mars Hill. And these were the two that came immediately to my mind, where he's preaching to unbelievers. He's preaching to heathen. And um, he uses the example of the unknown God. And he says, I see here you have an altar to the unknown God. And um, I, I want to tell you about this unknown God. And I want you to see, really, for all of you who want to be teachers of the Word of the Lord, this is the perfect picture of multicultural evangelism. Um, This is a multicultural city. It's a multi-ethnic city. They have multiple religions. Notice the tone of Paul. He doesn't even tell them their other gods are going to send them to hell. Oh, he could have taken the style and the tone of some of us, but he doesn't. He just starts with connection. And he says this, let me tell you about the unknown God. He starts right there. I want you to notice the care with which he addresses people who aren't where he is in doctrinal or spiritual understanding. I want you to notice the gentleness with which he leads people to greater understanding. Um, He only uses a tone of rebuke with people who knew better but have turned away from truth. They have rejected truth. That's the only time that he uses a more strident tone. But even there, even there, uh, he, is, he is fairly, he's fairly, shall we say, even-handed, uh, even though he can speak rather uh, tersely. Um, I want you to see what the kingdom of heaven should feel like. And so there are two lists in the Bible of, I think, shall we say, a grouping of what the kingdom of heaven should feel like. Um, uh, They are the list given to us in the fruit of the Spirit and in the gifts of the Spirit. I I want you to see this because one is given to us in Galatians chapter number 5 and one is given to us in Corinthians chapter number 12. Both of them are lists. Remember, this is fairly lit, a rare, where we're given a list of, of, of understanding. But here we have two lists. But there's a difference to these lists. One of them, you need spiritual understanding to perceive. And if you do not have spiritual understanding, these things are invisible to you. The other of them needs no spiritual understanding to perceive. Even unbelievers can see and feel and experience them. Do you see that? Two lists. One of them are for people with spiritual understanding. One of them are for uh, one of them is for anyone. You need no spiritual understanding. So let me give them to you. The fruit of the spirit is how the church should feel. The culture of the church should feel to people who have no spiritual understanding. They may be a believer, they may be agnostic, they may be atheist. But when they come among us, this is what the church feels like to outsiders. It feels like love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, And self-control. You do not need the leading of the Holy Spirit to perceive these things in other people. You don't need to be a believer to perceive these things in other people. Uh, Someone who doesn't share your doctrinal background could think of you. They are a person that really, they seem to love other people. They, they, They really seem to have a deep joy. They they, they're forbearing with other people. There's a kindness to them. They're good people. They're faithful in, in the things they say, and they're gentle people, and they live with self-control. You do not need spiritual understanding to perceive the fruit of the Spirit. Now, there's another list. You do need spiritual understanding to understand any of these things uh, that's in the Scripture. Um, here in uh, this, this passage in, in Corinthians 12, you see this with a chapter of love, tongues of men and angels, um, uh, a gift of prophecy, fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, I have a faith that can move mountains, um, even if I'm generous and give all of those things, uh, give all my things away. Uh, if I do these things and I don't have love, then I am, I am you know, really spiritually uh, ineffective. That's Paul writing. So let me give you the uh, 12 fruit of the Spirit, charity or love, joy, peace, patience, uh, being, uh, this is another way to say it, but uh, being benign, doing no harm, uh, goodness, 
uh, long-suffering, mildness, faith, modesty, uh, continence, chastity, all of these things, you can look in the New Testament and find uh, examples for them. Uh, there's also fruit of the Spirit, uh, or excuse me, gifts of the Spirit, gift of wisdom, a, a, a gift of knowledge or understanding, um, uh, having a judgment, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, uh, all of these things. These are the traditional church, not even reformed, but these are the tradi- traditional church um, definitions of fruit of the Spirit. All of these things are good. They're all looking at New Testament scriptures, and they're saying these things are good. How should the church feel? To people who have no spiritual understanding, it should feel like the fruit of the Spirit. We are patient with people. We are kind to people. We are long-suffering with people. To people who do have spiritual understanding, it should feel like the gifts of the Spirit. So let's say it this way. To outsiders, there is a patience, a gentleness, a goodness, a long-suffering um, kindness within the church that they perceive. But as they come into the church and as their spiritual understanding grows, they see that beneath that kindness, there is spiritual warfare happening. Peter, put up your sword. If you build a church on the sword, you're going to die by that sword. We're not going to do it that way. Jesus heals the servant, cleans up the mess. There's no evidence anymore to be used against Peter. The Lord has revealed how to treat our enemies. And then he says this, and I'm I'm almost done. I'm going a little bit longer uh, intentionally because I've been getting complaints that my Wednesday night Bible studies have been too short. So this is for you long-winded types. Jesus said to Peter. Peter, don't you think that if violence was the answer, I could pray to my father and 12 legions of angels would show up? And don't you think that uh, any, of those, any of those legions could handle business down here? One angel in the Bible kills 185,000 Assyrians in one night. It's an Old Testament story. One angel, 185,000 Assyrians in, uh, in one night. So let's just kind of scale that up here. Um, There are approximately 6,000 soldiers in a legion, 12,000 legion, or excuse me, 12 legion makes 72,000 angels. Any one of them can kill 185,000 Assyrians in one night. So, you know, on just just an ordinary uh, request of the Father uh, by uh, Jesus in this moment, and he has 72,000 angels. He can handle 13 billion, 320 million enemy soldiers. You get the idea. The point is, if violence was the answer, the story of Jesus would be about violence. If anger was the answer, the story of Jesus was, would be about anger. If rage, contempt, if that was the answer, then that would be the gospel story we were telling. But that's not the story we're telling. Here's the story. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Or, in a nutshell, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Peter, you need to get this. The church is not about fixing the world through force. The world is not about winning through anger, winning through rage. I know there's some churches that can feel a little bit like that, particularly when they get together and preach to one another. But I want you to see that's not the kind of kingdom this is. Peter, put up your sword. Those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. Lord Jesus, we're praying that you would be with us. As a church, we're praying that we would perceive your heart. We would promote your kingdom. We would seek what is your will, and we would comport ourselves in a manner that gives glory to your gospel. Lord Jesus, we want to be those people who are harmless to outsiders. We really are. They perceive our mercy, our long-suffering kindness. They get it. But as they come closer, they perceive that within the fruit of the Spirit is an opportunity to do spiritual warfare, and the gifts of the Spirit 
are what tear down the strongholds of the enemy and do great things for the kingdom. Be with your people. Lead us. Anoint us. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. We miss you. It won't be long. We'll be together again. Have a great week. God bless you.